All right, we're looking about, what about rewards? Uh, we know that eternal life, with many, many passages, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 being one of them, that eternal life is a gift. And then we have a lot of times where the Bible talks about being rewarded in the next life and blessed in this life. We have corroborating passages on rewards. While well, we're looking at 1 Corinthians 3, verses 15, which is the judgment seat of Christ or the bema seat of Christ, where you get rewarded if, you were, uh, if your works are of the quality of precious stones, gold, or silver, it gets, that gets tested in the fire and refined, and it lasts, doesn't get destroyed, and you're rewarded commensurately. But if you, the value of your life resembles hay, wood, and stubble, uh, straw, uh, it gets sent into the fire. Guess what happens to those things? It gets burned up, and you will suffer loss. Uh, you will not suffer eternal damnation or condemnation in the lake of fire, but the value of your life will have no value at all if all of your works are burned up, showing you have no eternal value, and uh, you will recognize and suffer the, the idea of what you could have had in eternity. Uh, we have other passages that corroborate this. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 15. And 2 Corinthians 5, 10. For we believers must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Let's talk about the same judgment in 1 Corinthians 3, up to verse 15. That each one may be recompensed, rewarded for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or, get this, worthless. That's a good translation. Worthless, not of any value. Make the print a little bigger here. Recompense is given what is due. Now, if salvation is not due me. Um, I received it as a gift when I believed. That's Ephesians 2, 8, 9, John 3, 16, and hundreds of other passages. So, given what is due him, in other words, rewarded or disciplined for his deeds, whether good deeds or worthless, or another meaning for that word in the Greek is evil. Worthless, kekon, or evil. Notice that here again it is the believer's works which are judged and not his salvation. Now his works are, are judged for eternal value, and if it has eternal value, God will give you a number of things, closer, intimate, relationship with him for the rest of eternity but that's what we see he's our savior and our god he is either rewarded or disciplined for what he has done with his earthly life and disciplined in his temporal life as well so it can't be fun living on for the future if you're not doing anything for the lord in the moment verses 1 through 9 in second corinthians chapter 5 indicate the believer's absolute confidence in his eternal destiny in heaven no matter what especially verse 8. We believers are of good courage. I say and prefer rather to be absent from the body than to be at home with the Lord. I have a nice resource here. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 through 7, leading up to the, at verse 8. Click on this app that I have on my laptop. And up comes four windows. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 7 is what we're going to look at. It pops up. It's an amazing little tool that I have. And good. Now we can hit the study button. And let's look at the NASB. Make this a little larger. Okay. Make it fill the window. So let's look at Second Corinthians five one through seven. For we know that if the earthly tent which is our house is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That is an eternal security, I don't know what is. For indeed in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our, with our eternal dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. We put it on when we believe, see? 
how important context is, the verses leading up to it develops and, and corroborates the context of verse 8. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. So the mortality is swallowed up by eternal life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, through his Son, Jesus Christ, who gave it to us the Spirit as a pledge. When we believed, Ephesians 1, 13 to 14, therefore, being always of good courage and knowing what while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. So there's eternal security again. For we walk by faith, not by sight. I don't see evidence of my eternal body being present in me. Uh, I read scripture and there's the evidence in my mind acknowledging the truth of it. Uh, but uh, we have a promise in scripture that be absent from the body, we're present with the Lord in this eternal body. <clears throat> and then it goes into verse 8, For we are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. We know this in our eternal destiny. We keep that in mind. We are attempting in each moment and each mortal day to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Okay, so this is a great resource. So, so it's just called Word Search. I'm in Word Search 12. I think there's a, an advanced after that even. So we'll go back to 2 Corinthians 5 8. We are believers are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. This verse is saying that we believers prefer to be absent from the body, which is to be present with Jesus Christ in heaven. A statement of the sure hope of the believer of his eternal destiny in heaven, no matter what. We look at 1 John 5, verse 13. While we're there, let's take a look. 1 John 5, verse 13. Open it up again. It's a great tool. It's good to happen right here so you can immediately look at the version of your choice. 1 John 5, verse 13. Open it up here. Make it a little bigger. And look for 1 John 5, verse 13. 1 John 5, 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. You have it in the present tense, and you have it forever. You're just going to switch out a mortal body you're going to, into a, an eternal one. All right. Moving on, in Colossians 3, 23 to 25, Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, and it's an eternal inheritance. It is not eternal life, because eternal life itself is a gift, but there's a reward of an eternal inheritance to build upon the foundation who is Christ of your eternal life. And that is an eternal inheritance in terms of, of a closer relationship with the Lord. Uh, certain things that are responsible, that the working for the Lord is always a great thing to do. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done. That's talking about believers as well as on. And that without partiality. And our Lord will bring these rewards with him when he comes again. Revelation 22:12. Behold, Jesus Christ says, I am coming quickly. That means uh, quick in terms of, of the speed with which he, when he comes, it will be so quick, it will be upon you before you know it. The time of, uh, has been thousands of years as promised to come, but when he comes, it will be rapid. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. So let's move back. Judgment for rewards in heaven comes before the tribulation. So this Bema seat in 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 15 and the verses that we just read uh, shows that the time frame is before the, the tribulation. 
we won't be there. So let's take a look. Other passages which indicate that the church age believers will not be present in the tribulation period. So the judgment seat of Christ for believers takes place evidently in heaven, unlike the events of the second coming which occur on the earth. Revelation 19.8 Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her the church. Oh, there's the church, the bride of Christ. Ephesians 5, 25 to 32. And where to wear that in the wedding? The church, the bride of Christ, wedding with the Lamb, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. So fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. So we can conclude from this, the church age believers will be with our Lord at his second coming, clothed with part of the rewards they receive for their righteous acts, those meted out to them at the judgment seat of Christ. Such dispensing of rewards must have occurred while the church age believers were with our Lord in heaven after he took them back with himself to heaven prior to his second coming, thus missing the tribulation on the earth during that time. It's called the rapture, which in this passage we're looking at, part of it, is in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 18, 13 to 18. Second Corinthians 5, 10, For we must all, we believers, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So in your body. It sounds like after that, the judgment seat of Christ must be in heaven. We looked at 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 15. And we look at the restrainer of sin. The Holy Spirit is taken out of the way on earth, necessitating the church to go likewise since it was indwelt with him. So the Holy Spirit is taken off in his presence off the earth in the sense of his influence. Uh, if the Holy Spirit is within each believer, the believers must necessi necess necessarily go to heaven also. And now you know what is holding him, the man of love that's his back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back, God the Holy Spirit, in his presence on the earth, will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. Now that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is not ever present because he's God, omnipresent. But the particular influence that he has in the world, evidently through believers who are present in the world. So if the Holy Spirit's influence on the world is done through the believers, then he indwells, and the influence is gone, then the believers are gone. Where have they gone? To heaven, in the rapture. We can look at the rapture sometime later. So 2 Thessalonians 2 7 quoted above states that the coming of the man of lawlessness will not occur until after what he is holding back or restraining sin is taken out of the way. And that restrainer is the Holy Spirit who indwells all church age believers, regardless of their faithfulness. The only agent which can can restrain sin is God, and historically this has been the Holy Spirit's work. Since he is removed, and since all church age believers are permanently indwelt by the Spirit, then the church must be removed also, and that would be in the rapture. Okay, now we can go back. Judgment before the tribulation in heaven. Let's see if that offers any more. The location of the judgment seat of Christ. This is where believers receive their rewards. They're already believers, so they get to be at this location before God. The scriptures detailing the judgment seat of Christ are found in Romans 14, 9 to 12, 1 Corinthians 3, 12 to 15, 2 Corinthians 5, 10. How we know that the judgment seat of Christ takes place in heaven comes from, the, from comparing scriptures with scriptures rather than from one single passage. Okay. Now, when Christ descends, we got a noise here we're going to let pass. Some carts are pretty loud. When Christ descends,